Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. S2 is the official cognitive evaluation in sports, from youth to pro, where athletes and coaches build to win. Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter. Today, we catch up with the VP of Operations for S2, Ryan Wiley. We dive into the early days of the company, reminisce about the early days, the evolution of cognitive testing in sports, the importance of measuring cognitive processing in these athletes, the logistics that go into testing collegiate and professional teams, and the value and insights gained from work with teams like LSU, Alabama, and many more. We also touch on some personal anecdotes and travel experiences that we've had related to our work in sports science along the way. Those that are new here, welcome. We're excited to have you. And for those that are returning listeners, we always appreciate your support to help continue our growth. We ask that you subscribe, rate, review the show. Thanks again to Ryan Wiley for taking time to join us today. Hope you guys enjoy. I have VP of Operations for S2 here with me, Ryan Wiley. Thanks, man. Appreciate you joining us. You bet, man. Let's talk all things operations. You were here in the early, early beginnings, Um, as is with any startup garages, right? Working out of garages, working second jobs. And this is kind of the second job. I know Brandon and Scott, same way. Take us back to the early days and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. So I am fortunate to be a brother of one of the co-founders, Scott Wiley, you know, back in 2013, probably 13, 2013, the idea when he and Brandon, maybe 2014, but when this idea was kicked around, because after college back in 2002, I moved out to Virginia with Scott, a clinical psychologist with a PhD in neuro, neuro, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, there was nothing for us to talk about. <laughs> I we I would often look like I was interested in hearing about the basal ganglia and the hippocampus. I did hear him recently mention basal ganglia. And yes, tried as hard as I could because he's my brother. We were really close, but when it came to his job, there was nothing that we could, (laughs) I couldn't even read half the, um, the articles he was writing or reading. And so when this idea came about, it was so fascinating because prior to this job, I was a teacher coach for 10 years and I coached high school baseball and basketball primarily and a few others, but I just was marveled at the idea that you could measure like what your brain's doing during Mm. play. I remember specifically, you know, in basketball, it was as simple as not understanding why, you know, (laughs) when I, you know, it was varsity and JV, I would... I was doing a little bit of both. I was at a small school, but um, but they I just remembered like trying to teach like how not to bite on a pump fake pass. And I would, you know, I'm playing, I was younger, I could play, and you know, I'd do a simple pump fake and everybody except like two people would bite on it and move. And I and it was like time and time again, even in the games, they just they wouldn't bite on pump fakes and mm-hmm. and and I didn't understand. I was like, well, why Why do these two, why can these two not do it? But why does everybody else? Like I would just assume all of them would because for whatever reason, they're, they're, they're 15 years old. And But um, but then even more so, I remember specifically talking to Scott about what you're, what you're measuring because I, I remember in baseball, um, coaching high school baseball, everybody in the school at this private school had to play a sport. And we had a kid on our baseball team that hadn't played baseball since like elementary school, but he didn't have any other sport. (laughs) And um, we had a really good team, which is crazy. We made it to like, you know, the state finals and semifinals every year. But, um, you know, we had a kind of a deeper team just to, because a lot of these kids had to play a sport. And what fascinated me the most, this was his senior year. And he was on his team. This was his first time at the school. And he could not play in the field because he didn't know where to throw the ball. He didn't have any understanding of the game, didn't know what to do, couldn't, didn't have a great arm. But he was a pinch hitter for us. And I believe he hit over 500 as a pinch hitter. When he got on base, he could, he didn't know what to do. He would always, I was the first base coach. He always had to ask me what to do and where to go and where to run and tell him when to run. But as a hitter. But 
uh, for some reason, he squared that ball up. It didn't matter how fast or the cur like it was curveballs, it was fastballs. Mm -hmm. I, I just was so marveled. Like, how could a kid like see it that well? You've got other kids on our team who've been playing since they were three. They go to, they take BP all day, every day, over and over. But they can't hit like this kid who has so little <laughs> little experience playing. And and Scott was like that kid's brain is probably processing. He probably, now that I understand like perception speed, you know, picking up spin and you knowing the trajectory of the ball, the timing of when and where to swing and controlling impulses and all those things that we understand now about cognition and sport, especially baseball, like it, it makes sense. But I, that's what fascinated me early on right. when just talking about the idea with Scott. And then once they started with LSU, back in 2014 and went and tested. Uh, it was in the summer, and we'll I was there. a teacher. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. But I, I'm, I, one of my favorite examples, you went to the hitter. So let's – you can't stand behind a hitter, right, in the batter's box if 95 miles an hour from 60 feet 6 inches is 380 milliseconds, right, almost a blink of an eye. If I sat behind the hitter and I said, what pitch is that as soon as the ball was released? There's no way I could even finish that mm -hmm. sentence. But – after that pitch happens, if I turned around and looked at the hitter and I said, because because everyone's like, you don't think while you hit, you just do. And I was like, well, there has to be more than that. And if you turn around that hitter and you say, what pitch was that? Fastball. Where did it cross the zone? I'll cross the zone or out, you know, knee high outside corner, outer, outer half, it was a strike. So what pitch was it? Where to swing? When did you start your your load mechanism? Well, I started my my move when he went left foot off the rubber. Okay, so you know when you started your rhythm. Okay, so what about when to swing? Did you swing? No, I check swung. Well, when did you stop your swing? It's like you could go through this series of questions that the evaluation is measuring. They are processing something because they can answer those questions. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Well, and just knowing if if I would have known this information or had access to this information <laughs> back in my coaching days. Now I see why people want to know about this because we know everything about them. We see them physically, how gifted they are as, you know, as a, right. you know, in basketball as a, you know, the physical makeup. Baseball is a little different because, yeah, you know, but as was long Paul, as you Paul yeah. Phillips, the, you know, our head of diamond sports here on staff played forever in a professional game. He, he tells us all the time, big leaguers don't get out, right? We're watching playoff baseball right now. Not one of those guys could you say, yeah, that he doesn't have good mechanics. He doesn't have good swing. Those guys all have great, perfect swings, and yet they, they still get out. They, they make poor swing decisions in the box. And I think that's what's so fascinating. Yeah, and that, that's when they came up with this idea about – these things that we tend to always talk about, especially I marveled at, you know, yeah, I, I, it's exciting to watch, you know, the, the freak athletes out there that just doing the things that they do, like when LeBron started and be able to generate that much power in these guys. But then you see guys that maybe aren't is gift like one of my favorite basketball players back 15 years ago was Andre Miller, who was not the most, you know, not well, I mean, I, I'm now. saying this compared to other NBA players because he's more athletic than 99% of human beings. But I mean, he just, he wasn't as the typical I like hoop. flash, but man, he just was so fun to watch because it just seemed like he saw things, you know, in a different way. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, that we're, we're measuring. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I come up with countless examples of, of how I've thought about this over the yep. years prior to knowing this and then now like that's i mean i couldn't love what i do anymore because well, what, of you talked about lsu let's go right into that experience right because that's kind of the first first trip tommy moffitt trained brandon back in in track and field cross country at um mm -hmm. ut now he's like hey how you were at lsu we kind of have this idea that we can measure this whole quote-unquote processing and then you guys go down to test i mean what does that process even look like like what are the conversations when as soon as tommy says yeah let's do it now it's like oh okay we've got to structure a plan together we got to go down and test we got to bring equipment yeah so that in itself because i i was not with the company then I, again, I was just donating my, my <laughs> summer time to go spin and hang out with my brother. And when this was happening, I remember driving to LSU with Brandon and Scott and they're like, well, this is, 
this, this, we'll see if this works, <laughs> you know, we're going to, we're going to hopefully give them something that has value, but we have no idea. It could be a complete bomb or it could, it could be, you know, something new that we believe that we think is going to change, you know, the way we evaluate cognition and, and how the brain is, is wired during, you know, during, during sports, yeah. which again, which I know a lot of people, it had nothing to do with intelligence or, or IQ, but just what the brain's doing in a dynamic, fast paced environment. And so that, that's, yeah, that in itself. So anyways, yeah, we, we were going up there and we're, you know, we're just, we're going to test the whole roster. Coach Moffitt was kind enough to let us convince the coaching staff to let us test the whole and the evaluation at the time was almost an hour, which Oof, now it's, it's, I think we got it down yeah. to about 42 minutes, yeah. but it was almost an hour. We got to set up all this old equipment, Apple equipment. And, <laughs> and, you know, we're just, I remembered it started at 7 a.m. and we didn't get done till, you know, in the evening for like three straight days. It was just nonstop on the hour, every hour. We didn't have as much equipment. We only had about, you know, four <laughs> testing units to test four at a time, 110. 115 players and yeah i remember we finished testing we're like okay we'll be back in a few days and so we had to do we drove right home and we had to start typing up every single report for they had to obviously they had to run the data in their you know in their i forgot what we were even using at the time but you know scott and them were just just grinding with the all the data referencing because we didn't have a database of anything to reference them to so we had to do it against each other. So that was kind of the beginning and man, t handwriting all these reports were spoiled now and all oh, the employees man. in the company are spoiled because of how, you know, they take a test. We have instant results. We don't have to do anything except to download. But, uh, yeah, that was quite, quite, um, quite a, <laughs> an experience in a few days. And then they, they went back, I had to head back home, but they went back and delivered the results. And, and I mean, you're talking like, legitimate real football guys for the first time that they're having to get in mm -hmm. front of. I mean, like Les Miles, Cam Cameron, these guys have been lifers in the game. And it's like, you tell me how this guy processes. So that is one thing that even though, and I, a lot of people don't know this about Scott. And, well, the people who know Scott and Brandon know this about them, but to other people who don't know or or have seen them on podcasts or whatever, but, um, despite being highly intelligent human beings and knowing everything there is to know about the brain, they are the most humble and like down to earth people <laughs> that you could meet. And so, I mean, there's a reason why we still work with LSU and all the, you know, our early customers from 10 years ago are still with us because of not just, you know, I think, you know, obviously the, the information and the, the value of the data is obviously very important, but yeah. the, they are not know-it-alls, but they didn't come in th saying, oh, well, this is what you got to do. And now that you have this information, you've got to do this with your football players and this. That's yeah. not, yeah, that's run not these how drills. it is. Yeah, yeah. So they they kind of approached it, and it's that's the, the beauty of, of what we do is we never – We've never, even to this day, we don't come in and tell people, you know, these pro or collegiate or anybody, even at the youth level, we don't ever come in and try to say, hey, this is this is what you need to do because we know this is, you know, the cog cognitive piece is just still just, it's one piece of the puzzle. Right. And we're not here to tell you, you know, how to change your practice or how to do, how to change your scheme or whatever. We're just like, hey, listen, here's what we measure. Here's the information about yeah. your players. What can we do to help? And what are there drills that we can, you know, look at? Do you want us to look at drills and give you some ideas, concepts, yeah. some things just to help blend with what they're already doing? Because, you know, LSU's football, I mean, there is no time to spare or add or anything. So we just want to kind of blend into what you're already doing, but also give you the information about these players that it, what do I, I you know this when when we first tested LSU's football team um I forgot which coach it was had could have been the head coach could have been offense coordinator I, I don't know but he s literally said what you guys just did in less than an hour with these players takes us between a year and two years to figure out he's like uh, yes, you're going to, we're signed up for, for as long as we can, because yeah. this information is so valuable. If I can know this about my, you know, DBs or linemen now, what you just gave us, like you guys were spot on. You've never seen these players play. You don't know anything about them, but this information is, 
exactly, you know, who they are and what they do, make the decisions they make on the field and why we need to know this information. And think about yeah. that statement in 2014, no transfer portal, or if there is, you're going, I mean, you're going from D1 to D2, right? You're going down a level that you don't have to sit a year. I mean, you do if you go Division One, Division One. The rules are so different. That was 10 years ago. Now, if you do it, right, I remember going to an SEC program uh, just it may have been within the last year. And I met the guy like in January or sorry, in August. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to play the season and then I'm going to go to the draft. And it's like, man, they, he may be here. He may legitimately be here for five months and hit their job is to get him to play and then try to get him drafted. That's what he wants. So it's like that statement of a year, year and a half. The whole goal is to make everyone's time to be more efficient. That's what's so funny mm -hmm. is, you know, I think early on and sometimes still even today we experience the pushback of like, oh, I don't have time to, to do that or dive in. It's like, no, no, no. The goal is to work alongside you, you know, in parallel to be like, hey, this is how you see this player. How do you want him? It's funny. A lot of those meetings have trended toward that way. Your usage of this DB, where do you want him? What role do you need him in against certain, you know, against certain offenses or what are you going to ask him to do schematically? That's where like the big help. I remember early, that was one of the LSU things was like, some guys changed positions and it really helped open up their, their to play more freely is what you, the term you hear. But I mean, that, that meeting couldn't have been nearly as intimidating as the Nick Saban meeting. Uh, then I know you love to share um, the first time you ever got to meet, meet coach Saban. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, yeah, we were, we were at Al Alabama testing their team, the Ross, same, same type of thing. We we're just testing. I'm sitting there and, you know, we monitor these players just to make sure they're, you know, you know, they're, you know, everything's working well, the machine, they have questions, whatever. And I get a tap on my shoulder and, and it's Nick Saban. I was a little, little shocked about that, but he said he wanted to come meet me. Well, obviously I am not the guy that he wants to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> my, my mediocre eighth grade football career, um, is not who he wants to talk to. And my, my, my teaching degree is not also who he doesn't mm. want to talk to. So I immediately, I think Scott had or Scott had uh, stepped outside for a second, and I immediately called him and said, "Hey, you need to get in there." And so, <laughs> and apparently, from what I found out, um, the meeting he was he was with with Coach for quite some time, at least over an hour or something like that. And I guess th you know I I don't know exactly how it works, but apparently the, he has runners come in every few minutes to to basically bail him out if he doesn't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> and so apparently he kept like push back, push back, push back. And apparently like to get that much time with him was, hmm. was not normal. And which was kind of cool just because, you know, he, he was, you know, fast fascinated with the idea that we could measure, um, you know, what, you know, these, yeah, obviously these kind of things on the field and, you know, to him, like, Hey man, I get all these, I get any athlete I want. I get the best five-star recruit I want, but why do some of them not pan out? Why can some of them not handle the speed of the game once they step on field? But why, you know, but then, you know, he may have a, a three-star, well, probably not many three-star, but anyways, but, but why, but yeah, so it just, I think that was just more of the fascinating piece about, you know, that you can, can, can measure this stuff and, and to the why, just knowing why, why is this guy struggle here? Cause I, I mean, if you're a coach, I mean, I like myself, when I was coach, I would have liked to know everything yeah. about the player to, to help them, obviously just to put them in the right position, put them in the right spot to, to be, to succeed instead of like, you know, forcing him to do something he, he probably can't do. Right. I, I think even to the simplest terms, I really like this example. It's like coaches want to coach more efficiently. Front office, want to, they want to be more accurate in their in their selection. They want to understand and make, make sure they hit. And players want to play longer. How can we help all the million infinity things that are measured in those in the, that category in between to measure success because it is so multifactorial? How can we be one step of that process to help the player play longer and the coach coach more efficiently and the front office also help their selection for scheme? I think that's the ultimate goal is like the best example of they want to play longer. They want to coach more efficiently. How do we help bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. And uh, while we're down memory lane, I just think about the time. I mean, because we're not there anymore at the combine. <laughs> like, 
uh, I remember one of my first times I got to go to the train station back for testing at the NFL Combine. That's not even a thing anymore uh, post-COVID. But like I remember early, early <laughs> on, it was like uh, we had a later at later evening shift because we'd be there for all day. Well, first of all, when, you know, obviously – when you get to go to these high profile type events, you know, some of my friends are like, Oh man, you're, you're at the combine. And <clears throat> it, yeah, what they see on TV is not what we there were are doing. There are cameras in we, the room that we're testing at. We're in underneath, underneath a train station <laughs> where they would put all the, you know, evaluate, evaluation type assessments, whatever underneath there. And a no window, just white, it is no glamour whatsoever. We don't, we're not out there on the field watching the players. We're not. You're we're not just, going through the gauntlet. We're just stuck in a hot, like room where these players. I mean, we would have to, you know, um, turn guys away because they'd be trying to come oh, at like late. eleven yeah. o'clock at night, yeah. and we're like, dude, dude, we don't. We we know that you know you. We want to get guys as as fresh as they they can be, but those days those. Athletes from 6 a.m. till midnight is what their schedules pretty much were. And I just remembered countless times just, you know, the, the, the yeah, there's, we have tons of stories of, of <laughs> kind of the issues that we had. Our evaluation needs Wi Fi and there's zero Wi Fi when you're surrounded by cinder block walls. And we're having to like fight with the, <laughs> the hotel people to, to let us have access to Wi Fi to be able to run our evaluation. I, I mean, we got some cool, you know. We got a cool memory of, you know, we working with LSU. We t we tested Joe Burrow. You tested Joe at, at Joe Burrow at LSU, but then also, um, you know, he he probably didn't have to because you know obviously we we do have we have shown on our website which we are allowed allowed to share. We he did very well in the evaluation, but had come back and it, it was probably right when we were about to. To you know, stop allowing people to come test, and it was ten o'clock. Like, what are you doing here yeah. so late? Yeah, we're like, why are why are you here? Everybody already knew he was going to be the, the number one pick off and, a historic season. And, and he's like, what are you doing here? Yeah, and so he's and but just, I mean, you just love those moments when you know he just has the best attitude. He's a competitor. He's like, I want to, you know, basically it was, you know, I want to do better. I want to do do better on the on the test. I'm like, at ten, you really? He's like. Let's go, man. Let's 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 knock it out. Let's Whatever. get it done. Just just had like the you're like man. That guy's that guy's it's hard winner. not to root for. Yeah, that it's guy. hard not to root for a guy when you have you know moments like that. But yeah, you know there's tons of moments. Or when lot, you guys left great... me to go get Jack's donuts in its heyday. That was because worth, it was closing. That was one of my favorite memories of all time. I at was your expense. I was new. <laughs> I was newer. Or, yeah, I only had one or two guys not, in the room. Yeah, there there is a cool. Well, there is a really cool donut place that we were in the just these long days. We're starving. We haven't eaten anything, and and we go. <laughs> I, why did all three of us have to go? There was four we, of us there. Three of us left you by yourself because there was no one there. We wanted to get out, walk around like because one or we had two just people been sitting all day yeah, long. I was going to finish up, lock up, <laughs> meet y'all back at the hotel, get a donut that I actually ordered, not the fritter. Yeah, which I did chew on for a few and, days, and within. I think 20 minutes. I mean, it was, you guys hadn't even gotten to Jack's yet from the train station. And, and I, the none room of was us, full. Yeah. He got, because we, we brought about 15 I was stations. Like, I, 15 people came at once. Was like, he was, you had people waiting. And we, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we did not rush. We were not in any hurry <laughs> to get back because we've been sitting in that room for 12 hours. So it's a long day. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's funny. Moments. So walk me through like a, Operations wise, I think some of those early events in spring training, because baseball, I know baseball, football, really the early ones, the spring training aspect of like, yeah. okay, so these teams ask us to come out twice a year, fall instruct spring training. What's that look like? We're working with the teams for, for getting these guys evaluated. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's pretty simple. Like, you know, spring training is a great time to test, especially, you know, these baseball teams carry, you know, a couple hundred players from you know, the minor leagues. Back when it was yeah. 48 rounds. Oh, yeah, yeah. Multiple so you, years, I short mean, you had, seasons, yeah. Yeah, so we, those were, I mean, we, we would go out there each team for about three days and just testing. And my favorite part is when you had coaches and hitting instructors because I think baseball, because my opinion is that hitting is the hardest thing to do on the planet, whether it's baseball or softball, hitting a rise ball, 
you could argue that that's the I've never thing done to it. Do. Yeah, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, you know, it's just how fascinating, how forward thinking, like especially baseball. When I mean, you think about hitter <laughs> hitters. I mean, how many guys hit three hundred this year? Oh, it's uh, all time low, right? Yeah, was well, it fifty five something uh, back in the oh, back in the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we yeah. Don't, don't see that anymore. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, yeah. T- I mean, there's hardly anybody hitting 300, which means there, you know, people forget that you know you're getting out seven out of ten times, and you're considered the best in baseball. Yeah. And you know, I think the good coaches, and there's a lot of good ones, obviously out there, especially at the professional level, how hungry they are for information and to see, you know, their fascination. Now, 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 we hired Paul Phillips about uh, a few years after I started, yeah. which. He has he played in in the major you know in the big a little leagues. bit more credibility yeah oh yeah 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 he's you know he's like <laughs> the Kevin Bacon in baseball he's like one <laughs> person for knowing everybody but uh, he's fun personality but before him like you know because him when you step in anywhere he can find anybody and talk to anybody because he's got that credibility <laughs> as a player and also coach professionally and so it's always nice to have. A guy like him who understands cognition and played at the highest level, obviously. But early on, before that, it was just Scott and Brandon who, um, you know, Scott actually played um, college collegiate baseball, nothing spectacular, but and then blew out a shoulder. And, you know, back in the late 80s, they didn't have the technology today to recuperate and recover from that. But so anyways, like, but again, both Scott and Brandon, humble both know sports, which is rare to have, you know, these cognitive nerd, I won't say it. Uh, these guys, smart, very intelligent guys who understand the brain, but also know sports. And so to hear them and watch them, I mean, that's where I, you know, learn most of, you know, just listening to those guys was just the best part of my job. It's just yeah. because I'm learning so much. I feel like I have an honorary master's degree in, in cognition. Um, I haven't got my plaque yet. Yeah, how do you get those? Um, Who sends that to you? I, we'll, we'll get them. Okay, okay. But but yeah, listening to them and just having these coaches talking to these you know these PhDs and just marveled asking question after question after question, trying to understand why guys make certain decisions. What does it mean? What does it look like from the time the ball, you know, time from the ball that comes out of the hand, like what is going on from A to B, like the ball coming out of the hand to actually, you know, controlling your body to swing. They're just marveled at all the pieces involved and what your brain's doing and like just the questions. And I mean, they would sit in front of a staff of like 40 coaches and just all like were mesmer, you know, just completely like you know, into it, asking question after question, a 20 minute meeting turned into a two hour meeting. And they asked to come back the next day because more coaches, yeah. they said, you know, wanted to come and check it out. So that was the best part is just, yeah. you know, exp- seeing how we were exposing the professional world to something new. Yeah. Well, I think even to your point, we talked about this literally before we came in here, this whole processing decision-making statement, ah, oh, he's a good decision maker. All the time? Is he uh, like in what situations and what scenarios against what defense? And like it's it's become this buzzword of like he's a good decision maker. Well, it's like, well, if you look at whatever it is, right? Those two terms where it's like these are those two, yeah, those two terms, they become this buzzword of he is this and they get labeled a good decision maker. But we want to help them understand why, because Mm -hmm. it's not always, you're not always going to make great decisions. Great players still make poor decisions sometimes. And so what scenarios get them into those, those predicaments where they might not be, or they may be a little bit susceptible to biting on misdirection. Why does play action work? Play action still works. We've been doing reverses, fakes, jukes into rounds we've been doing it forever right because you think it's this but i'm actually telling you this it's amazing to understand this but i we we got into this Mm -hmm. this morning yeah well and and to also think that like decision making you know what we're measuring where you know our professional evaluation and obviously every sport is different and what they're doing but we scott and brandon spent time and sat down with with gms head coaches hitting coach or whatever sport that top guys and to come up with the evaluation, it's not right. like we just were like, evolved. "Hey, this is what it is." It, it was like, "Hey, what are the, the these are the systems yep. we can measure? What would you like 
to have happen. And so after, you know, a year, you know, a couple of years of figuring that out, yeah. like, so we have, you know, people, you know, you can't just look, it's always good decision. Well, we, in baseball, we measure eight things in football. It's nine things that we capture. Yeah. So what part of it, like, you know, there's, you know, so many things that your brain and, you know, is doing in, a four second, what is the average time of a football play? It's like, oh, what, it's, it's, four yeah. seconds, but like, like even, that? even to that, in that same breath, it's like the stuff we were measuring before I even got here is not the tasks that we no. measure it today. And That's so right. it's how it's evolved and talked to. Uh, so, okay, it, can you describe in a nutshell what the VP of operations does for S2? Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, so early on, it was, um, you know, big part of my job, obviously all logistics of like testing, setting all that stuff up with working with the, you know, the teams, every, you know, college professional of like, you know, the days that you're, you know, obviously logistics of, of travel and all that stuff. But, you know, a lot of it, of what I do now early on was, was the, you know, data acquisition for both NFL prospects, major league prospects, and, um, you know, delivering deliverables of the data reports, that kind of stuff. And then you came in and now you're my right. I mean, I clone, I was told to clone myself and I did with you and that's now you've got all football. I've got all baseball. Um, and then we've got a team of, of field ops and other areas that we kind of like are, you know, handling all cause we travel a lot. We, you know, a lot of what we do, the testing, no one, no one come, I wish teams would come to us, but we go to them and we're constantly on the move. We've got a mobile lab, you know, guy, guy who drives <clears throat> that for testing. So it, there's just a lot of logistics and data and it's anything and everything for, for the, for the company. Thankfully, we don't have to do any more <laughs> regre regression, regression testing for coming. our IT staff. Bless their hearts. I love. Bless their hearts. I, you're Southerner now. <clears throat> Californians, they don't say that. Yeah, you're right. Bless I, your heart I'm far, down here. I'm far removed from my California days. <laughs> but that's the other part is that we have a whole nother, you know, IT staff that's, you know, because our system is all run, you know, through coding, developing, all that stuff. And so that, what we don't have to. Yeah, they're the early days we incredible. were testing and doing all that. But now we had a team that does all that. So. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the gist of, all right, let's get into the three random funny questions. Last segment that we have on here. You were supposed to give me those ahead of time. I never, these are the questions I don't give anyone ahead of time. They're not that difficult. Although the last one might trip you up. I'm, I'm personally excited. No one else will care, <laughs> but I'm really excited. Uh, one of my favorite things that we do specifically you and I is when we rarely get to go on trips again, uh, together, we, we try to play some pickup. We try to play some disc golf wherever we are, uh, whether it's in California, rolling down the hills um, at the former uh, oh, NFLPA game that we used to go to. Uh, now it's not a game anymore, but it could be from there to Birmingham, Alabama at 5 a.m. in the disgusting wet swamp because uh, the dew is still on and I don't bring an extra pair of shoes. What what memory or course sticks out as one of your favorites that we've, we've gotten to take? Course? Oh, man. Uh Favorite disc golf course um, or memory traveling memory, thinking that a large coyote was a dog. Holy smokes! I forgot about that was one. Uh, was that that rattled us a little bit. Where was we that? Were, we Phoenix? were in Phoenix. Phoenix at the not at uh, Phoenix has one of the most beautiful courses. It's not the best maintained course, but it is on the hill. I yeah, I forgot what it's called, but it's up on the hill, and so you're just overlooking the whole. Valley. It's, be so it's absolutely cactus. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So many cacti. Um, but yeah, that, but on a separate course, we were kind of like on, what are those called? Those little, uh, drainage. I mean, it was pipes. literally yeah. drainage down yeah. and city city. And they were like, we can put a course in here. Yeah. So we're playing there cool. and we see a dog that we thought, and then we're like, Oh, look at that. And I'm like, ah, oh, no, I that no, is that's definitely that's, not a dog. That is a large a, coyote. Oh yeah, it was coming. And it was running at yeah, us. Yeah, it was I'm running like, at us. Thankfully, we just it just kept going. Didn't want anything to do with thankfully. us. Thankful, thank goodness, because it was. Oh my at gosh, I forgot all 6 about Six a.m. in the morning. It and was. No one would, would Holy have heard, smokes! I forgot. No one would have heard the screams. No one. Well, yeah. I thought you were going to say the time. Uh, traveling gets interesting, right? Because you you go out and you're like, oh man, my flight's delayed, but that doesn't mean it's going to stay delayed. And so you were at an event that I was <laughs> not at. 
you went to go play the course by the Dodgers stadium up on the hill. And then, cause you were four hours delayed. And then did you happen to randomly check? Yeah, that was, that was dangerous. Even in LA, I should have known better, but yeah, I had a, <laughs> it said it was a four hour delay, which is odd early in the day to have a four. Usually when you get there, it gets delayed, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, and then it does, but it was like six hours before my flight. So I'm like, oh man, I got to kill some time. And I had brought a couple of my discs just to, in case I had time. And I did. And I went up there and about halfway through, I looked and the, there was zero delay. It was gone. It's like it was there and then it disappeared. So I had to hightail it. Thankfully, it was in the early afternoon. Any later, you know, I would have been hosed and would have missed my flight, but I made it just in, <laughs> just in time. As a professional traveler, what's your like, this is the one piece of advice for someone who is going to travel what is it? Oh, man, I, wh- personally, I like to find hotels that are, you know, within our, you know, our budget r- region that is close. I, lo- I like walking around and like seeing new stuff. And so I don't like getting the hotels next to the freeways. If I, if I have to drive a little bit, like if there's a better spot where it's like near, I mean, a pretty area or whatever, I mean, I guess that's not really anything beneficial or helpful for people. But if you do travel a lot, you probably figure that out anyways. You don't want to say. (laughs) Not Um, a concrete monster? No, no. If peak Larry Bird and peak Clay Thompson were in the three-point shooting competition, who wins? Peak. Jeez, that's a great question. (sighs) Larry Bird. Wow. I I cannot believe. You know I love Clay. And love that pure shooting form. I don't know. I think birds, arrogance, confidence. And a competition. And a competitive nature. I don't know. That's the, close. The real question is how much trash would he talk in between shots and in between racks? <laughs> Now that you're, we're seeing all these videos of every single player who's ever played against him or seen him it's play, it's my favorite. It play. everybody has a, tra- a <laughs> trash talk story about Larry Bird, which I love. It's so, my favorite. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's one of my favorite things. Dan Patrick will always ask, "Give me your best <laughs> Bird story." If you played against Bird and he knows it, he's gonna get your Bird story. I love it. It's <laughs> it's such good content. So you'd say Larry Bird? Yeah, I, I, it'd be hard to it'd be hard to root against. Larry Bird in in that kind of era, but I but again, I mean that's in the era where they didn't shoot the three as much as they do now. And, Could you imagine Clay is just so oh. pure and you know you give Larry Bird just, eight three point shots a game, he's not going to do better than four. Come on, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I'd still I'd still I put my money on Bird. Come on. Was it Pat Riley that said what was the? He's like if I wanted to if I needed someone to make a shot at the end of the game, I'm picking. Uh, Michael Jordan, but if I needed someone to save my life, to just take a shot to save my life, it's Larry Bird. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd probably pick Bird in that Larry situation. Bird. Yeah. Ryan Wiley, VP of Operations for S2. Appreciate you joining. Uh, thanks for coming in, explaining some kind of a trip down memory lane, talking about <laughs> operations, the historical run that, that the early days that people don't really get to hear about. Appreciate you sharing. You bet, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the S2 Cognition Podcast. If you like the content we're putting out, please subscribe with that plus sign at the top of your app, leave a review about the episode, and share it with a few friends. You can follow us on Twitter at S2 Cognition and Instagram at S2.Cognition. If you'd like to get in touch with the program or show, please visit our website at S2Cognition.com slash podcast. Thanks again for listening to the S2 Cognition Podcast. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter, signing off for now. We will talk to you soon.